here's where we'll dive into some of the, the physio techniques. And bear with me here, Vinda, I know you won't be doing um, too many of these in, sure. in the room. Um, but I've got, I've got a, an X-ray up there and, and we've ha had some fun with this over the yeah. years. Um, so is there adequate range of motion to perform the task well? Well, really physio's job I think here is um, important that we restore the arthrokinematics of the joint. And if I draw a, a line straight down that tibia, and I'll ask you, does that, well, the line is actually in line with the talus. Um, so I'll, does it run directly up uh, for the center of axis of movement on the tibia? And I'm hoping you can see that it is not the case. So that's a weight bearing X-ray. And uh, this, is, this is something that, uh, well, how long ago did we talk about this? 20 oh, years ago? Look, you, you educated me. I must admit, I, I wasn't aware of this, uh, this issue. I've told lots of people since then, but You've got two curved surfaces. One's the tibia, one's the talus. If they don't match up perfectly, they don't move properly. And all you do is you can work as hard as you like to try and get dorsiflexion and all you're gonna do is jam up the front and hurt them. And I was unaware of that concept until I was educated. Uh, and look, nor was I, uh, because we, as we come out of university and and we're desperate to get dorsiflexion back. We know that, we've learned that. And so the first thing we do is start getting patients to lunge. Um, and, and, uh, and when they, they're stiff, we ask them to lunge harder mm. and further and more. And, uh, and then maybe even accuse them of not doing their exercises uh, well enough or hard enough. And um, once we under, you understand the arthrokinematics, and that's just the, the talocrural joint, the same is true of really everywhere in the body, particularly the foot and ankle. Um, if we can restore that through a few different techniques, then we can maximise their, their range of motion. Um, and I'll go into some more detail here. Um, so th this is uh, some, some footage of a real patient. Now, th this, there is a syndesmosis injury, but there was, there's an associated fracture. And um, this, is, this is his knee to wall test. This is something that uh, we want to be doing. Um, so if we, we look at the the first uh, video on the left, you can see just how restricted that is. So he's measuring, self-measuring with his fingers there, three, three fingers away mm. from the wall. Mm. Um, with a really simple, now I know this would be considered a calf stretch, um, but the way we put that patient into that position, so we ask him to take his hips with a straight knee up and over his ankle. Yep. He doesn't feel impingement with that if we play around to get that tension on the posterior chain muscles, yeah. so the calf and the, 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 the hamstring all is seen as one unit. And we take him forwards and we get him to hold for 60 seconds. And, and we've played around with the dosage a lot in the clinic from 30 right out to three minutes. 60 seconds seems to work really well. And then literally straight after that, we get him to retest the knee to wall. And you'll see um, quite clearly here what happens here. So he's already at what would be defined as a plus one um, and he would have been what minus four um, centimeters probably before, and so and he's he's probably now plus two in his in his knee to wall. So um, this look this is a this is a fun um, video sequence that really uh, highlights the point yeah. of um, uh, ensuring that we restore the arthrokinematics um, early on, and uh, as part of that we want to and you'll see in a second that I, that I I'm big on stretching the calf. I, I must admit I, I'm a pretty simple person, my concept of that is that the back of um, the back of the ankle and the calf and all those structures are tight and in essence that you know if your foot's on the ground that's the fixed point and the tibia is slid backwards so that all of a sudden your curves don't match up and that that was a really enlightening concept to me. I thought to myself, no, that's got to be rubbish. But um, having seen a number of patients rehabilitated in, in different fashions, uh, I've become a total believer that if you loosen off the back, get the cams to match up, that then they, you enable them to do their rehab properly. Right, so if the posterior structures are too tight, then, then the tibia isn't allowed to glide forwards if there's any sort of restriction posteriorly. Mm. Um, and uh, th there may be a true um, a glide deficit, which yeah. we can do with our hands. And so um, for the physical therapists out there, that there's in Australia, Havinda, um, there's, a, there's a bit of a push to be hands off, yeah, no. and I'm I'm not in that camp. Um, I'm I, I think that's because there's no evidence for sure. it. But um, I think uh, we we don't want to lose those skills, and and so uh, my hands are on most um, patients. 
all patients, I should say. Um, so here's a couple of techniques. How do, how do we fix that, those arthrokinematics? Here are a few examples. There's literally uh, hundreds of, of, of which I could do. I do a fair bit of soft tissue work through the back of the calf. Um, there's, a, there's a multitude of ways of doing that. And uh, as long as you find something that's effective for you and, and the outcome and reassess after doing that, I think that's the important part. Um, here's the calf stretch. And I showed you without a board with that patient just before. Um, so uh, here's a 30 degree angled board. And this is really a progression on what we were doing before. Um, and yeah, it's a calf stretch, um, but the way you get into that position is really, really important and will make the difference between ankle impingement and not ankle impingement mm -hmm. and getting a, an effective outcome. And um, we'll use this one a lot. This is a, a good evidence-based treatment. Um, here's an AP glide of the talus. Um, so uh, we, we typically the talus will sit forwards yeah. um, in, in, in the mortise. Uh, it rarely sits rearwards, but it can. Um, the, the common position, um, particularly if the patient has been immobilised in the post-op period, um, perhaps not at 90 degrees, then, then those structures that are posteriorly get shortened. Um, so Bill Vincenzino in uh, Queensland showed that this is an effective um, short-term treatment for improving uh, dorsiflexion. We use that one a lot. Now the patient can do that themselves uh, with using a band around their talus. Um, Really importantly, it's got to be on their talus. If it sits on the tibia, uh, that's not going to be effective. So here's a, a, a patient mobilisation with movement example, and the patient dorsiflexes into, um, into a lunge position with the, the band holding that talus rearwards. The other thing that you notice is that all of a sudden when they start doing the exercise in that position, their pain's better. It's, it's better than when they were doing it you know, without, in a sense, the talus pulled backwards or the um, uh, the tibia pulled forwards. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll, you want to start utilising these treatment techniques in the in the post-operative period as soon as you can, as soon as they're peeled up enough, so so uh, as as fast as possible. And um, particularly, I mean, some of these apply for for most ankle issues. Subtalar joint mobilisations. Here's how I do them. I'm doing them in sideline. Reason being, it takes the calf. Um, off stretch so we don't have to fight against um, any sort of a calf restriction and the other way uh, other benefit of this particular position is allows me to really control the talus um, I've just crossed that uh, Marcus's leg up there to block his knee so it doesn't bounce off the table because I put a fair bit of force through this so making sure that you take up the full ankle dorsiflexion range will ensure that the talus isn't just rocking in the mortise and you're actually getting movement through the subtalar joint